Jasper John's Something Resembling Truth is a survey of John's work that we co-organized with the Royal Academy in London. Jasper John's turns 88 in May, and he has been active as an artist uh, since the early 1950s. Jasper John's found himself a part of uh, people like Merce Cunningham and John Cage, and especially uh, Robert Rauschenberg. And together, um, they ushered in a, a period of collaboration that really changed what art could be and what art could do in very dynamic ways that we're still trying to get a handle on. The Crosshatch series, it's a sweeping exploration of the work of Jasper Johns. And the Broad approached me to conceive of music that could pair with the exhibition. They knew of my work studying and performing John Cage, uh, with whom Johns had a very close uh, friendship with. For a lot of these pieces, a, a composer presents the performer with choices, responsibilities, and yeah, a task in a way of realizing the piece. Even if all the notes are there, one might actually have to still make a choice of the form. That's different, again, from like a, a classical piece of music or a romantic piece of music that hands the notes, dynamics, and the expectations at least are, are clearer in terms of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to sit at the instrument and make these sounds happen. In developing this series, to me it was a total wish list moment to say, can we invite Joan LaBarbera to perform in one of these programs? These are iconic works that she performs iconically. I'm excited to share a performance space with her to present these important, iconic, playful, delightful, really powerful works with someone who has for decades presented sort of the defining versions of these pieces. I worked with John Cage for almost 20 years. I was trained as a classical singer. And at a certain point, I became frustrated. I was kind of boxed in being a classical singer, and I thought that the voice could do many more interesting things than what I was being trained to do. Almost every sound that I make, anyone else can make. It's just a matter of um, going in and investigating and trying things out. So, let's see, um, inhaled glottal clicks. Oh, oh, oh or um, multiphonic, which is um, essentially like double stops. So it's, it's creating two pitches at the same time. Um, ugulation, little fluttery sounds. So um, these kinds of sounds were things that, that are part of what is considered kind of my unique vocabulary, although we can all make these sounds. The problem is that we sort of socialize these sounds away and we stop using them. Rich, it works, men. Sequestering low lovers, lost properties of the cells. The leaf thinks from a burger's night. Whoa. The piano is so steeped in history, and it's, it's a cultural item. People might think of the piano and they think of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, or they think of their piano lessons as a kid, or... To me, the piano as a vessel for experimental procedure um, is interesting because audiences and you know, listeners can see this, the piano and 
see a performer and see uh, experienced composers challenging associations or actually kind of just turning the instrument inside out and, and exploring it for all, all the things that this machine does and is. The piano, I mean, I, I'm surprised every day that the piano is treated often like as if it's this natural object that just fell from the moon. You know, it's treated like it was a tree that grew and that's this sacred thing. And it's kind of crazy to me because the piano is a totally artificial machine. The sound that we have when we touch the key, it's, it's, it's the sound of a piano, but it doesn't, it's not the same as the sound of the wind or <laughs> a waterfall. And I think that's actually really interesting because to me, it frees the piano from all of those associations and all of these responsibilities that we don't owe the piano actually anything. And yet, I think culturally, and somehow in the realm of what we might think of as concert or classical music, there's this sense that we do. We really don't. That sort of free thinking, I suppose, if we want to think of it as free thinking, I think we can see it in all different kinds of art forms, in all different kinds of manifestations. The, the, the connections, the simultaneities, uh, the overlapping of works is so much a part of uh, Cage's philosophy, Cunningham's philosophy, and Jasper John's philosophy. If you move through this exhibition, and it's so beautifully designed um, because you have themes, it's not chronological, but in any particular room, you will see uh, similar iconic images that repeat in, in the various uh, pieces. Uh, but he has these images that recur uh, through the work all of his life. A lot of times in, um, in art, we focus on images, perhaps too much. We focus on things like flags and targets and numbers, and that, that's what steps forward in John's work for a lot of people. But the more you get to know it, the more that you can fall in love with individual marks, how he does things that are a little bit more subtle. Uh, the way that he lands a brush stroke or the way that, that he'll make a mark. And you'll see those marks repeat for 50 years. And some of the things that initially seem like an accident uh, gather steam and study and become uh, deep parts of his work. I would encourage people to follow, you know, what he does with a single nail or a piece of tape or watch for this, this mark that he makes that, that looks like a little bit of a squiggle. Once you see the squiggle, you'll see it everywhere. Jasper Johns in the paintings is taking elements and themes that are so familiar, again, like a piano is familiar. And he was taking things that with strong associations and almost like a collage artist, except he's painting them brilliantly and with extreme discipline, but really pulling from all, all these different places of, in my estimation, it seems like he's pulling from his subconscious. I find it really interesting that in a single work, we might almost experience a, like a thin slice of his subconscious in one moment and that he could actually devote however amount of time to just capturing that. That one slice, which of course is changing all the time. I still think that people in all our own ways can find ourselves wrestling with the challenges that this work poses to us or even with our own preferences, our own kind of ways of viewing art. It continues to ask questions about what our values are, um, whether or not it sits well with us. And that doesn't mean it's a good or bad piece of art, but it actually reveals our own preferences. Unfortunately, people are comfortable with what they know. If they go to a museum, they want to see the paintings that they know. If they want to go to, if they go to a concert, they want to hear Mozart and Beethoven because it's, it's comfortable. So the idea that they have to go and hear something new is, is really challenging. What, what Cage always wanted was that the audience just be open as he was to the surprise and the fascination of hearing something for the first time. I think that the work can be deep, but it can also be funny. A lot of things are, um, are there to make you smile. 
and that that's not something that uh, Johns is particularly known for, but I would encourage people to look for those moments because they're there and they're 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 great. And you know, part of the part of the quote that became something resembling truth. He asks us to look for these flickers of, of grace in the work, these, these moments of, of resonance. Uh, I can tell you they're all over, and so um, you'll be happy when you see them, I guess you could say.